So let's see. I knew that I was different when I was about five years old. We lived in Kassel, Germany on an army base where I went to American kindergarten. The teacher there, Mrs. Smith, had me sit at the back of the class with the only other black kids, three of us in a row. I figured it out sort of then, something was up. And I remember at one point I asked my mom, who's white, why does daddy have to be black? So uh, when I was 15, I was at a, a day student at a private Catholic boarding school for girls in Northern California, very hoity-toity. And there was an audition for a Shaw play, Androcles of the Lion. <laughs> <laughs> at this private boys school nearby and since they needed a female lead the director held an open call at our school uh, I was so excited because I knew this lead role of Lavinia was just perfect for me perfect she was the noble born Roman who was persecuted when she converted to Christianity this was me I knew this role so by this time also I'd proven myself my acting chops at my school I was you know and all the productions and all of that. I felt pretty confident. And I auditioned and I killed it. However, a girl from another school also auditioned. And I remember she had waist long, dark brown hair, and pale skin, and freckles everywhere, and piercing blue eyes. <sighs> she had also admitted there that she had never acted before and auditioned on a whim without even preparing. So the opposite of me. I also remember, for some reason, exactly what this girl wore at the audition. <laughs> Baby blue bootleg Lee cords, a very cool embossed uh, brown leather belt with a big brass buckle, white tree torns, that was the rage then, and a dark blue cotton floral blouse with short puff sleeves. This was the late 70s. The cast list was put up on the school bulletin board right there, and I looked, I looked again, and my name wasn't on it. Classmates who were at the audition came up to me and said, but Mimi, you were the best one there. I was numb. I, I wanted that part. I was right for that part, not that girl with the freckles. And I, I don't know what it was, maybe it was her long hair, but <laughs> Lavinia was my part. She was beautiful and strong. She was arguing against oppression and hypocrisy. In the face of death, she would not conform. You know, when she was confined with the, with the Christians, she, she dared to even flirt with the, the Roman captain, standing her ground saying, no, but my faith like your sword needs testing. Shaw gave this young woman this voice, my voice. That night, I got a call at home from the director. <laughs> and he said I was so good that he still wanted to have me in the play. Aha! He made a mistake. I knew it. He's calling me to give me that part. But then he said, so I've written a part just for you. OK, I thought, well, OK, this is still good. Then he said, it's the part of the lead slave. Did I hear him right? Slave number one? <laughs> well, Androcles was a slave, and he's the hero of the story. But this felt odd. I, I wasn't certain really why it felt that way, but I was just so desperate to act. And I thought, OK, there are no small parts, just small actors. That's right. So I said yes to his offer and began rehearsals at the boys' school. I admit it was really, really hard to witness the freckled girl there struggling during rehearsals. Clearly, this was not her raison d'etre. Unlike me, theater was my life at 15. This was also the first time that I ever acted on stage with boys. I went to a girls' school. Um, so I had crushes, and uh, rehearsals were odd. I was the only person of color there. One white boy that I liked kept trying to high five me <laughs> as if this came naturally to me. I didn't, <laughs> you know, 
mind you, it was the 70s, and you know, it was all about high fives and expressions like far out and keep on trucking, and <laughs> peace signs were everywhere. And this was the era of the smiley face, and you know, black power was in the air. Something about a love of watermelon and fried chicken came up at some point from one kid, but I swallowed my pride and thought mostly of the part I was playing. I was going to be the best slave number one ever <laughs> in the Roman Colosseum. <laughs> Yet, I felt very different during this time, even on the planks where I always felt comfortable. I always felt comfortable on stage. This was home. On opening night, we had a great audience, and the lead pulled it off. Applause, yay. My parents came to see me. Uh, they waited for me in the audience with a bouquet as I gathered my things in the dressing room where saying goodbye to the cast was really pretty uneventful. <laughs> I left and saw my parents standing there, smiling, ready to congratulate me, but I walked right past them, up the aisle and away from the theater. It hit me like the first time when I saw them, how blatantly different they were from the other parents there. I hated that they stood out. I did not want to belong to them. I didn't look back. When we got to the parking lot, to the car, my dad asked, what, what's the matter? And I said, nothing. We drove home in complete silence except for them saying that they were so proud of me. And by the time we got home, I was so sick with this feeling, right here, this feeling, this loving couple who worked seven days a week so I could be in this play at that school. I walked right past them in public. Shame on me. Shame on me. So I sat them down in our living room that night and boldly asked my dad, why he married a white woman. Why did you marry mom? <laughs> he said, it's because I loved her. I love her. And I asked, are you ashamed of your race? Because in marrying mom, he was moving away from his people. He said they both faced challenges, but they both made a choice. So when I announced my identity, my blackness, my mother said again, as she often did, but you're not black. I knew what she meant, my mom, in her thick French Bordelaise accent mixing with the Tennessee regionalism that she picked up <laughs> from my dad. <laughs> she saw me as more than one thing. But I corrected her this time. No, Mamo, I am black. I am black and I am white. You cannot say this anymore. I am. They were very patient with me that night. I cried. I vowed to do something with this discomfort that I felt of being different. The next week, I made a haircut appointment and asked the stylist to cut off all my long, straightened hair and give me a natural. <laughs> you know what a natural is, right? <laughs> I was free, scary. And that week, I also happened to win a lottery prize at an Indian import store where I chose an outfit to wear for free dress at school. There at my school on a crisp Monday morning in Monterey, I opened the assembly doors to the student body of 350 mostly white girls and walked in with my short natural, wearing a royal blue flowing maxi caftan, <laughs> and my earth shoe sandals. <laughs> I had arrived. I was witnessed. I felt all eyes upon me. Just then I became different, but by choice. I knew that I'd better embrace, embrace, embrace this difference or suffer a lifetime of shame ignorantly placed upon me by others. So for Shaw and Lavinia, God bless her, and for this, I am forever grateful.